Thank you very much. I first want to acknowledge all the members of the public who came and spoke on, on behalf and in support of this issue. We're here to talk about the potential purchase of 571 and 599 Harbor Drive as a neighborhood park. The neighbors have been informed of this presentation. They were invited in June and, invi and invited again tonight. As you heard, um, uh, some of them already speak to that issue. We have identified for purchase two adjacent parcels are 32,525 square feet. The parcels are along on one of the highest pedestrian routes, the Linear Park, also known as Harbor Drive. It is a prime location to provide all of our residents recreational green space to use and enjoy. So these would be combined into a single neighborhood park. And specifically, this is uh, an aerial photo showing both properties. Um, 571 is the one that is more square sitting on the uh, property and 599 is on an angle. This shows both what is the property records view of the county plus the extra space that you get for use of swales here. The swales are wider <coughs> on Harbor Drive. That's why there's more space. And really the total usable green space combined is 32,525 square feet. My name is Marcos Acosta and um, I'm the owner of the Demolition Discount Incorporated and I'm here in Key Biscayne working for the village doing the uh, demolition of two houses that uh, is going to be a future park for the community and um, I'm grateful um, that I'm doing this job for them. How long did it take you to tear the house down? Uh, to tear the house, this one is a little one. This is going to take me two days to do this, uh, the first one and the other one is, is going to take me about six days. So I'm thinking about uh, eight to ten days, working days, to complete the whole job and leave it flat and clean. tear down a house, is the retaining wall the last that comes down? We have to lift the, the walls up and I gotta get rid of the trash first and after that I remove the walls like concrete. Basically the retaining wall is concrete. Today is June 12th, 2020 and I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, Steve Simon, I'm standing on five nine, the property of 599 Harbor Drive, and this is adjacent to 571 Harbor Drive, our future neighborhood park. I'm just thrilled to see this progress.
My name is Arielle Simon and I'm the Village Horticulturist. We're standing at 571 and 599 Harbor Drive, the future site of a local park for Key Biscayne. And because this is going to be a nice neighborhood park, we really wanted to make sure to preserve any of the existing specimen trees uh, that we could. Uh, unfortunately, there was a large gumbo limbo on one site that had been uh, dying and it was in decline and um, so we couldn't save that one. But we were able to save these two amazing specimens of Royal Poinciennas, Delonyx regia, that are behind me, as well as another gumbo limbo over to the side. Because of demolition, we knew that we needed to do something special to make sure to protect the trees. And really it's not something special, it's something that should be done on every construction site. So we have root protection barriers, um, these zones that are marked off by fencing to make sure that the roots are safe during this demolition process. And the reason that that's so important is because as much of the tree as you see above the ground, there's just as much and more below the ground. And what happens during demolition and construction is with heavy machinery running over them, the roots get compacted, the soil gets compacted on top of them, but also the roots toward the surface can get very damaged. And so we have these lovely specimens of Royal Poinciana's behind me, which happen to be in bloom at this time of year, gorgeous. Uh, another name for them is flamboyant trees. And they are a highlight of life in South Florida. I mean, you always recognize them around this time of year. They're in bloom on many streets throughout Miami. And what's wonderful about these is they are probably at least 30 years old, I would say. They're pretty much at their mature height of about 40 feet and with mature canopy spread. This one you'll notice has less of a canopy spread than the other. We did have to trim it back. We had an arborist come in before demolition happened to make sure to prune the trees so they are structurally sound for all future growth and all future projects because we really want them to last and be here for a long time. When you take out the swimming pool, do you fill it in or do you take all the concrete out? Well, I, I remove the whole pool, all the concrete comes out and I, I, fill, it, I fill it up with fill with the same uh, dirt of the lot. Hi, my name is Chris Mack. I am here at 571 Harbor Drive where I lived. I moved into this house in 1980 and lived in this house until 1985. The thing I loved most was the openness. If you look through, those, there were glass doors in the back and they opened up right into the wall. So you could be inside the house yet feel like you were totally outside. When we lived here, there was no swimming pool. It was just a backyard. This portion right here is an addition. Originally, the house started here, and a driveway came up through here, a circular driveway. When we moved in, there was wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in here. And my husband and I came to look at the house he stood right here, and within minutes, his white shorts were black with fleas. So the people who rented it to us had to take out all the carpet. It was just infested. And it had terrazzo underneath, which was wonderful. The terrazzo was a great floor. They've done something here. There used to be windows. They must have enclosed the windows. There were windows that you could open, and they were like awning windows, louvers. And you could open them up up there and get a beautiful breeze coming through, plus having those 
doors open back there. And I see my favorite wall here. My daughter, who was four, was running somewhere and she ran into this wall and a little piece of plaster fell out. We didn't do anything about it. But after the people who bought the house moved in, I came over about three years later. So this would have been like 1988. And they invited me in to see what they had done with the house. And lo and behold, that little chip was still in the wall where my daughter had hit her head. But I don't see it now. Looks like somebody fixed it. There was a beautiful fireplace right there with a large sitting area right in front of it built in. It was just gorgeous. And we actually, it got cold enough back then that we used the fireplace. I see that they changed the sliding glass doors and put in doors that were would open. Over here, a lot has changed here. This was the original kitchen. The house stopped here. The dining area was here. And this is pretty much what the original kitchen looked like. A step down. I think they added on in the back there. And of course, it's a little more modernized. Another sink over here. The original sink was right here. And this room was not here when I was here. It's an addition. It looks like it could have been a media room or a master bedroom. So this was the hallway to the bedrooms. There was a bathroom here. A, a little bathroom, and there were three bedrooms back here. Little bedroom at the end, I imagine right where that part of a wall comes out, and a middle bedroom. Somehow it was reconfigured. This was the master bedroom. And then there was a middle bedroom and then a small bedroom. On the other side. Yeah. Three bedrooms, two baths. Yes. My oldest daughter went to the community church preschool with Mrs. Davis. And uh, we had a lot of friends who lived in this area. Kiba's game is very different then. I would say permanent residents, there were probably 7,000 at the most. How did you discover Kibiskane? Well, <laughs> actually, we have long ties to Kibiskane. My Aunt Jerry was best friends with the Mathesons. And she used to come across the bay before the bridge was built. And she said, my mother used to tell me, oh, Aunt Jerry swam across the bay. And Jerry told me, no. I would walk across at low tide. There were a few little places where I could swim across a channel. But she told us how she sat at the Mashta house, and she and Cree Matheson watched them build the big bridge. And that's the original bridge, not the one we have now. And she said they were just fascinated by it because there never seemed to be more than three men working on that bridge at any one time. So. Uh, when I was a little girl, we used to come to Florida for Easter vacations. And one time we came down to Key Biscayne, and that was a long time ago. And we visited the Mathesons at the Key Colony, where they had a motel and a golf course. So that, that was Key Biscayne. My brother and I caught a chameleon, which was a real tourist attraction, took it back to Philadelphia with us. And the chameleon from Key Biscayne, his name was Key Biscayne, he lived for quite a few years. He had a very nice life in an aquarium in Philadelphia. Uh, when I met my husband, I met him in Fort Lauderdale, and he had a job offer in Miami. 
So we were going to get married and we came down to Miami from Fort Lauderdale to look around. He said, oh, there's a sign for Key Biscayne. I've heard of Key Biscayne. And I said, oh, I've been there. So we came out and we fell in love with the key. So we rented an apartment on Galen Drive, the Coral Reef Apartments. We went in, we had absolutely no money whatsoever. And the woman who was the manager, her name was Irene Durr, she said, well, I have one apartment that's furnished and I rent it out to people during the season. But I like you so much, why don't you rent that apartment and I'll give you all the furniture for $25. So suddenly we had a dining room table, a bed, a dresser. We had a furnished apartment for $25 for the furniture. So we lived there. And then when my daughter was born, we knew that we needed a house. And by that time, the people who owned the apartment said we needed a house <laughs> because there were no children in the apartment. So that's when we came here. We had the apartment and all we had to do was get married. So we went to St. Agnes and talked to the priest and he married us at St. Agnes. Very nice. Then we told my mother. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> do you remember who the priest was at St. Agnes? Sure, Monsignor Nealon, a lovely man. He went to look and see when he was free to marry us and he opened up his engagement book and he found a day which was very soon like it was the next weekend he said well we could do it on Saturday so that's what we did and the house next door was $5.99 shortly after we moved in a couple who had just retired from Boston moved in their name was Donlin and the Donlins had a daughter who was in law school but they were wonderful, wonderful neighbors. And together, we learned about Key Biscayne and the intricacies of our houses. For instance, when he went to empty the septic tank, he could not find the septic tank. And someone advised him that it was under his addition. Uh, back then, there were no codes and people just built where they wanted to build. So uh, I don't know if they uncovered the septic tank or if somebody maybe in, along the way had a new one put in. But his wife lived in that house until she was too old to take care of herself. And no one owned that until she sold it, which was a couple of years ago. How do you feel about the house being turned down? Is it kind of bittersweet? It is very bittersweet. Yes. You have a lot of memories here. I do. Yes. But they're, they're memories of a different place. It's different now. Key Biscayne is different. The house is different. Everything is different. But it's kind of cool in the way there'll be a park here. It can be in the same place, which will be nice. It'll be very nice. Yes. I think that's lovely. Simon, uh, in June, after first going to the Parks and Open Space Board and receiving their endorsement, I stood before you to present the concept of combining two adjacent and oversized lots in order to turn them at 571 and 599 Harbor Drive into a park. That night was all about the attributes of creating a park in that location. 
Those benefits ranged from the traditional recreational opportunities that are implicit when one thinks of open space in a park to the broader and more relevant definition of also including such terms as a resiliency plan and components of a stormwater improvement plan <coughs> under the umbrella of public park purposes. 